Hello everybody. Well, uh, I could tell you many, many things about John McQuarrie. I could tell you that he is a university professor of uh, language and literature studies. He works at Nottingham University. I could tell you that he has written so many books on the language and literature interface. I could tell you that he has given conferences in over 50 countries. I could try to memorize the list of books that he has written, and I would be unable to list all of them. And still, I wouldn't do any justice to him, because till I met him yesterday, I didn't know anything about his human side. And I am going to tell you today. I am going to tell you. I asked him, uh, when I was having dinner, I asked him, John, why did you start writing books? And he gave me what I consider a very moving answer, and I suppose you will agree with me. He told me, because I wanted to help my students. The students needed my help because there was a huge gap be between what the students needed and what the students had. So I think that says a lot about him, and that's why I am so pleased to have John McRae with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that a nice introduction? <laughs> I was terrified in case she was going to say something about my nasty and horrible side. <laughs> this is my nasty, horrible side. This is my human side. We will play the human side today. Yeah. The subject of my talk this morning with you is creative reading. Because that word creative normally goes with writing. It doesn't normally go with reading. And I want to, with you, show you how to read creatively in the hope that you can transfer the skills to your students. I'll start by taking my jacket off, but that's the end of the strip. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> On your sheet, you have some terminology which I consider to be quite important because when we talk about language and first and foremost we are teachers of language the language we are teaching is boring the textbooks that we are using are boring that's why I started to write materials for students to help them not to be bored. We know how easy it is for our students to be bored. Even if we are good teachers, even if we do all the good things and come to all the nice training courses, students get bored. Especially teenagers. Teenagers have a very low boredom threshold. They get bored within about two minutes, three, on a good day, if there's been a football match the night before, maybe four minutes of interest. But then we have to do something to get them back. And we have the problem, at least I have the problem, I imagine you have the problem, students don't read. And I think this is because we are now living in a visual culture, not a verbal culture, where my generation, and I'm as young as some of you, there's nobody here, no, nobody here over 40. Good, good. The, the, our generation was brought up to read for pleasure. But reading for pleasure is a minority activity now. In our generation, I think it was a majority activity. Most of us were brought up enjoying reading. And there were books in the house, and books were just a natural, normal part of our upbringing. That's not true so much nowadays. There are students who read, but I think they are few compared to the majority whom we have to encourage, push, hit, <laughs> in order to get them to read. And the language that we are teaching in a foreign language situation is not language which interests them. 
They are on the internet. They are talking to people worldwide using internet English, which is different from the English we are teaching them. When they're listening to music or MTV or things like that, the English they are hearing is different from the English we are teaching them. That's a problem for us, I think. And we have to bridge these gaps. And the first bridge, I suggest, here we use the old-fashioned magic machine. I make no apology for not using PowerPoint. I am tired of PowerPoint. <laughs> where the people put the words on there and then they read the same words. And then you're stuck with the the opposite the it's hard to call them slides in that order. And I am a teacher who never follows a teaching lesson plan. Because I think if you make a lesson plan, after about three minutes, you're going in another direction. So this is my first transparency. And the words referential and representational are, can you see? You have everything in the way. Uh, Good one here. Let me define these for you and see if you recognize what I'm saying. The language that our textbooks give us to teach our students is referential in the sense that this is a chair, this is a table, I am a boy, you are a girl, what do you want to do about it? It's language for transaction, it's language which remains on one level, one word has one meaning. That is purely, if you like, denotational language, referential language. And I want to suggest to you that no language in the universe remains at the referential level for very long. Because language is representational. It goes beyond the denotational very quickly. And one of my favorite examples in English, you know the idiomatic expression, this is not my cup of tea? Yes. What does it mean? I don't like it. It's not my thing. In American English, they sometimes say, it's not my bag, <laughs> to mean the same thing. But I invite you to think of a referential situation where someone would say, this is not my cup of tea. It's not easy, because you have to have different cups of tea, and then you have put down your cup of tea, and I give your cup of tea to her, and she says, no, this is not my cup of tea, meaning that is my cup of tea. It's almost impossible situation. The language of the idiomatic phrase, this is not my cup of tea, is purely representational. You with me? Yes. Yeah. Now, I think this happens in every language. Transfer it to Spanish, of course it happens. Transfer it into Basque, and of course it is happening all the time. Language means more than the dictionary definition. Always. If we say uh, the traffic is flowing smoothly, flowing is a verb which initially applies to water. Yeah. Representationally applies to the traffic to my speech, which is flowing remarkably smoothly, <laughs> considering it's the first time I've spoken in this part of the country. So I want my students, this is the first gap I need to bridge. And here we have another representational use, bridging a gap. That's another representational use. Once you start to see this, you will see representational everywhere you will see more and more language that isn't referential. And I need my students to be aware of that from the beginning so that they can start to see language better rather than see language as a dictionary dependent thing. I agree. Yeah, that must be for me. It would be, it'd be <laughs> Hollywood said they would phone. <laughs> it's that Tom Cruise. He wants me in a movie. It's very difficult. Now, 
In order for our students to be able to read beyond the referential level, they have to go beyond the reading skill. Because the reading skill is reading the words only, and perhaps doing reading comprehension. Now, what do you think about reading comprehension? As you can tell from my representational face, I don't like reading comprehension. Multiple choice, A, B, C, D. In fact, I am president of the International Association for the Abolition of Reading <laughs> Comprehension. And I'll tell you why. I'm not a very good teacher, and you are probably very good teachers. You never go into the classroom in a bad mood. You never go into the classroom wishing you didn't get up that morning. Never. You always go in happy, smiling. I don't believe you. <laughs> However, one morning I went into class and I greeted them with the traditional greeting, shut up. And you, you know how they know you and they think, okay, okay today we leave him alone. And they, they, they sort of... And so I gave out the copies and I said, get on with it. And I sat down, probably I had some marking to do or something. And they said, but, but, and I said, shut up. Get on with it, do it. And of course, they did it. And what I had brought them, I had only photocopied one side. <laughs> I had brought the questions, multiple choice, A, B, C, D, for the reading comprehension text. <laughs> it's still embarrassing, even now. <laughs> and <coughs> they did it. <laughs> <laughs> very, very worrying. More worrying is they all passed. <laughs> because they're not stupid, the kids, even though sometimes we think they're stupid. In the multiple choice reading comprehension, very often, A, B, C, D, it's the longest one. <laughs> very often. Very often you can, uh, you can eliminate because it just doesn't feel right. And in 12 questions, they're going to get six, correct? Even without reading the passage. Now, this is the sort of thing that we can do when we have a university connection. I was teaching in a school at that time. But I proposed this as a research. And we did research in many places. And the results were always the same. They didn't need to read the passage in order to pass the test. Nobody was getting 100% correct. Nobody was getting zero. Most of them were coming between 40 and 60%. So most of them were passing. Which seemed to me to prove that reading comprehension in that multiple choice sense is neither reading nor comprehension. It is information transfer at best. Interesting and I think rather worrying. Because it leads to the question, what do we want our students to read when we ask them to read? Reading for information, okay. On a referential level, they can read for information. But if we're talking in a more literary sense, what do we mean when we say progress as readers of literature? And that's a quotation I want to show you. I've put it on the sheet that you have. This is a quotation by a guy you've maybe heard of, Jonathan Culler, very well known in like structuralism and things like that. I hate him for a simple reason that he is exactly the same age as me and he still looks like Dustin Hoffman did in the <laughs> He looks 25 and uh, he is of course 40. The, 
the quotation that I've given you is an important one. Look at it. Our examinations are designed not to test, it's Alex's mind, whether or not a student has read and remembered certain texts, but to evaluate his or her progress as a reader of literature. Now, in language teaching, we are preparing the students all the time for tests. Tests to see if they have learned this vocabulary, these structures, this grammar, these various skills, the four skills, reading, writing, um, listening, speaking. But when they are reading something more literary, you cannot test it in the same way i.e. test starting from, say, 100 marks, taking marks off for what they don't know. We can evaluate, and that seems to me to be more positive because you are evaluating, if you like, from zero and rewarding the progress. I think that's an interesting dichotomy which we have to think about. How do we evaluate progress? as readers of literature. It's not something we can do by quantity. It's a qualitative question. And who is to say that you are a better reader than she is? But that's the position that we find ourselves in as teachers. And our students, understandably, are offended if they can do very well in a language test and not so well in a test about reading. So let's see what sort of things come into play. You want to see a text? Yes. yes. You're here to make progress as readers. I'm going to show you a text that I use a lot. <coughs> Some of you may know it, it's quite well known. And your stimulus for your reading is the stupidest question I can think of. I love stupid questions. Because stupid questions can often lead to intelligent answers. My question to you is this. What's it about? Forty, love. Forty, love. Middle-aged couple playing tennis. When the game ends and they go home, the net will still be between them. Nice one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So now, can you see how stupid my question is? What's it about, please? Can we have an answer from everybody in the room? Let's see how many different answers we can get to the stupid question. What's it about? Who wants to begin? Anybody going to begin? What's it about? Oh, I love it. I look at you and I hear an answer from over there. <laughs> That's the famous problem of the cross-eyed teacher. You look at them. So what's it about? Who who was answering here? I was saying syllables. It seems like it's one syllable mid. I know middle. But anyway, it's an answer. It's an answer. <laughs> Stay true to your answer, even though you reject it later. Yeah. She says it's about syllables. That's not what you were going to say. What were you going to say? I think that it's about the relations. Relations. Relationships. Any other offers? What's it about? Marriage and boredom. Marriage and boredom. You say that as if you have some experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know anything. What's it about? Love in the 40s. Love in the 40s, yeah. Which we don't know about. Which we, we, we don't know about. What's it about, Lonnie? What might happen when we will be? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Now she's already interpreting it. What's it about for you? Uh, I agree with all of them. You agree with all of them. There's always one like that. 
We haven't had the other traditional answer, which is, I don't know. <laughs> or, uh, I work in Italy a lot, boo. Uh, they, they look at you, boo. <laughs> the most common answer I get from teenagers is that it is about tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Now tell me, are they right or are they wrong? Uh, of course they're right. Uh, because at one level, it is almost referentially only about tennis. Mm -hmm. But at another level, it is about that word there, the most dangerous four-letter word in English. <laughs> But there's a double meaning. Do our students know the double meaning of love in the context of tennis? Do you, no? Because this is a good opportunity for them to look up in their horrible little dictionary. <laughs> He's just fled embarrassed. <laughs> the, the idea that love is nothing. Love is zero in the score of tennis is a surprise to many readers, a surprise definitely to our students. Love, do you know, do you happen to know how it comes to be love in the score of tennis? 40 love, 15 love, does anybody know? No, it's a good one because when tennis was first Oh, the, here we have the, the problem, invented, discovered, um, uh, C Columbus invented America, remember, he didn't discover it. Um, when tennis was first played in the court in France of Louis the something, they made the score with an abacus which had balls on it, and the balls were called eggs in French. You know the word for egg in French is? Neuf. And you know how the English cannot pronounce any other language? Luf <laughs> becomes love. Zero in the score of tennis, ping pong, one or two other things. So it doesn't mean love. So that's the first surprise for our students. They've learned something. Because with every text, I actually want them to learn something. Also, we are teaching them language as well as hoping to encourage reading. So, double meaning there. And they like the syllables aspect of it because they've never seen that the word between has the same B as a syllable. So they like the word play. They like the game. Mm -hmm. But can I suggest to you that for teenage secondary students, 40 is Jurassic Park. <laughs> they know everything about love, much more than we knew at that age. And they think that anybody over 40 has no kind of love <laughs> in their life. Therefore, it is essentially true that they are reading a different text from the text that we are reading. Because when you give us your interpretation, you're doing what we all do. You are bringing your own experience of life to the text. You are bringing who you are to the text. And who the reader is <coughs> contributes something to the meaning of any text, which is why Many of us spend a lot of time trying to find texts which are suitable for teenagers. And of course, the danger is that you choose texts which they find patronizing, or banal, or stupid. In fact, they are not stupid and they want to be stretched. They want to go beyond. Mm -hmm. So, the answer to the question, this is why I like the stupid question, what is it about? is different according to who you are. And that is something that we as teachers must factor in to every text that we look at. Because you know yourselves how some texts that you tried to read when you were younger and you couldn't 
then you can come to them later in life and you go through them no problem. Who ever read Dostoevsky as a teenager? Yeah, you read him later on, you can cope with him. Now this seems to me to be interesting for what we're teaching. But there's one thing that none of you have told me and none of my students tell me that this is about. This text is also about textuality. In the sense that it shape of a tennis court, the score of tennis, the shape helps the story. We're going to do our first exercise. I noticed that some of you, many of you, have already, yeah, have, have, have already taken down this text, which is good. Now you're going to do it again. But what I would like everyone to do is to write this as an ordinary sentence or two. Okay? Rewriting the shape. Keep the words, but rewriting the shape of the text. never have an easier exercise than that. Because actually it's just copy. But if I may take yours. What you should have is something that looks a little bit like this. Two or three lines. And this is where I ask the students a really serious question. Which version has more impact? Obviously, the words are exactly the same, but the layout, the format, is different. And I want to suggest that this one means less than this one, because the layout contributes so much to the impact and the meaning. And this leads me to my first big conclusion of the morning. In referential teaching, we are concerned all the time with the question, what does it mean? In representational teaching, we are concerned with the question, how does it mean? Now, I think that's a really important question. Because the question, how does it mean, involves individual readers, involves the shape of the text, involves knowing some things, involves, if you don't know that love means zero in the score of tennis, mm -hmm. the text will mean differently. It will still mean something, but it will mean differently. And it seems to me quite important that we help students to see that they have an individual contribution to make in creating the meaning of the text. The meaning of the text is not some hidden secret locked in academic mystery. Most university professors in my experience, and I speak as one, 
want to hold the key to all mysteries of literature and want to reveal little things of literature, little by little, so that they can then, at the exam, say, no, you don't know anything. I know everything about literature. Literature has become a kind of exclusive academic discipline, which is wrong. I'm much more democratic in my feelings that everyone wants stories, fables, rhymes, songs, poetry, images, texts, jokes. Everybody wants these. These are part of humanity. It is not an academic discipline of exclusivity, which is why I wrote a book once called Literature with a Small L. Mm -hmm. Literature with a Small L is anything imaginative which we may want to take in to class for our kids. But literature with a small L involves us being able to read any text. That's a text. And that involves layout, as this did. It involves design. Now, this is something the kids can relate to, because on the net, they're playing with typography, the font, the colors, the layout, they are very creative in their use of layout themselves. So let's grab them on that, help them on with texts. You want another text? Yes. I have an endless, <coughs> endless supply of texts. As Lolly said, I've written so many books, I have so many texts that we could look at. I like this one. It's good because it makes everybody move. Everybody, I don't know why, but everybody goes mm, when they see this text. Now you can see it's a nice, simple text. But you know what? Most teachers I offer this text to tell me they wouldn't know what to do with it. Because to a certain extent, it just is. You read it and you think, yeah. Any suggestions what you might do with it? To make a conversation with the person outside. <laughs> Making a conversation with the person outside. Now keep that in your mind for a moment, because you, you, you've read ahead on my script. You know where I'm going. <laughs> Because what I find is that in our training and in our teaching, we don't have a strategy for this kind of a text. We can look at it, and I think most of you are thinking, yeah, OK, got it. You can see what, it, what it's doing. You can see something. But to take it into class and teach it, remember I said with 40 Love, I want them to learn something from every text. What kind of learning aims? Well, yesterday was primary school day, and what was her name? Karen uh, would, would like this one. I've been very brave. I'm not good with the little ones, but I was very brave. And I went into class of eight eight-year-olds, because a teacher invited me. And she said, they'll love this. Do it with them. And I said to the kids, what words can you see? All right, and they can see, obviously, I cannot escape. They can see the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, what other words can you see? Mm -hmm. Law, remember I said last night we were going to talk about law. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. all, all. He. and you can imagine that a class of eight-year-olds, they're now screaming because everyone can see a word. <laughs> And they are, because at the age of eight, they still have the imagination. By the age of 13 or 14, the system is beginning to suffocate the imagination. But we have problems here, because what do you say as a teacher if they come up with a word that might not be a real word? Because, for example, a word that often comes is ewa. Ewa. E-W-A. 
And the first time it happened, I thought, oh, whoops, we have been brought up never to say no. <laughs> You've got to encourage the students. You mustn't say no, because then that student will go quiet. So I said, Ewa, that's a nice word. Positive word or negative word? Tell me, what, what would they say, Ewa? What would your young kids say to the word Ewa? Positive or negative? Positive. 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 Now, universally, Ewa is positive. Why? I think because it's close to the name of Ewa. And therefore, I, I ask them, is it a male word or a female word? Always female. Is it a light word or a heavy word? Light. Now, if we can start them thinking in that way about vocabulary, we are kind of demystifying vocabulary a little bit. Because that will turn out to be, when they're teenagers, that's their biggest preoccupation not knowing vocabulary. They think that literature in English is a conspiracy against their ignorance of the vocabulary. <laughs> Why do they use all these difficult words? Yeah. So if we can little by little demystify that process, we're doing something positive. Here's another word. Oh, by the way, teenagers. You can make this into a big exercise. You can say, right, how many words of three letters can you find? How many words of four letters can you find? How many words of five letters can you find? Teenagers always find the word wallet. <laughs> I think this is because they are so used to stealing from their father's wallet. <laughs> but what if they give you this word here, H-E-W? There's a lovely word. Hugh. H-E-W. Does anybody know that word? H-E-W. You think you know it? Well, check with you in a minute. Because that's a word I imagine most of us don't know, and even native speakers wouldn't necessarily know it. H-E-W. And the best definition I have had of hue from my students is it's the sound a cat makes when it sneezes. <laughs> 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 Isn't that great? <laughs> now, I want, you see, I want to create an atmosphere in the class where the student doesn't feel stupid making a stupid definition of a word. That's fun. That's not stupidity. That's fun. It's not ignorance. That's creativity. It's not mistake. Because in referential language teaching, there is a right answer or a wrong answer. In representational work, there are very few wrong answers. One of the things that I think we should reward is creativity. Then you, as the teacher, can decide to explain the word you. But I promise you, they won't remember it. What do you think you means? Do you remember? Something connected to the weather, and it is uh, ice and water in the morning. Or that's dew, I think. Dew, yeah, on on the flowers or on the window. No, that's dew. Hue, no. Oh, good. E even the management doesn't know. So that's good. that's good. That's good. No, it proves my point because it's an unusual word. Hue is what it's to quarry marble or to hew, it's cutting huge things like marble or huge big trees. Mm -hmm. And it's a very unusual and very specific verb. So you don't need to remember it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is another thing that I, we as teachers need to think about. What words do you think they will remember from a class? Because they sometimes write down every new word in their book, or we even teach them new vocabulary. Do they remember? <coughs> of course they don't remember. How they remember words is when the words are memorable. And I want them to remember the memorable, not memorize the forgettable. <laughs> because we do that, you did that at the 
college and university, I did that at college and university, you memorize lots and lots of forgettable things. I remember going into exams trying to keep my head steady so that nothing falls out. <laughs> and then you sit at the exam desk and, <laughs> and you just pour it all out. Completely useless way of learning. Anyway, there you are. There's some interesting vocabulary things here. Now I'm going to go into the middle. And I like this a lot. What we are doing actually is called textual intervention i.e. we're playing around with the text. We are intervening on the text. And in the middle there, it says, I cannot escape. And I want you to think about this for a minute, because the fifth skill that we're talking about is thinking. Thinking about how it means. Thinking about how the text works. It says there, I cannot escape. My question is, would it be different if, instead of I cannot escape, there was no escape? No escape. And you're thinking, you see? Mm -hmm. That silence doesn't mean you're sleeping. It means you're thinking. We have to learn as teachers to judge when the class is sleeping <laughs> and when it's actually thinking. The constructive moment of thinking is unusual, but it happens. That was it. Now, you see, I think that we intuitively have an answer. Is it different or the same? I cannot escape, no escape. But we don't really know how to formulate that because we haven't been trained to do it. So I'm training you now. Because I help my students with the next question, which for you is heavier? I cannot escape, no escape. There are one or two people saying I cannot escape, the majority saying no escape, I think. And you know what? That's what always happens. Because there is no correct answer, is there? Both are possible, but most of us would say no escape because it's more negative, more blocking. But think of the other side also. I cannot escape is personal. Therefore, yeah, it's very strong for I. My point being, both answers are possible. But subjectively, most of us will prefer one answer rather than the other one. And in that case, what matters is this. What matters is the process rather than the product. It's not the correct answer that matters, but the process of thinking rationalizing, feeling even, that leads to an answer. Therefore, we have to enable our students to do that thinking and then say something or write something about that text. So if I'm a teacher and I've done this with a class, how happy am I if my students say, Looking at this text, I feel no escape is very negative because it is general. I feel I cannot escape is more personal. Full stop. Small paragraph, but that's a great answer about this text. And you know the most positive thing is that suddenly they begin to feel confident that they know they can say something. Because the biggest problem I find with students and reading is that they get through the text and they think, okay. And they look at you with that look they have. <laughs> what do we do now? Well, if now they feel able to say something, we've won. We're getting somewhere. We're showing that they can. And the people who have to be convinced that they can are the students. 
because they think this is a foreign language, it's difficult, I don't know what to say, I'm not a literary person. Many teachers tell me I'm not literary trained. You don't need to be literary trained. You just need to be sensible, really. Which not every teacher in our staff room is. We know that. But never mind. We don't <laughs> criticize our colleagues, do we? <laughs> yeah. Another text? Yes. Yes, please? Yes, please. Yeah, we, we teach manners as well. Yes, please. <laughs> not every day. Um, right. We're going to be processing. We already saw this one. Is this one similar or different? Similar or different? And even visually, it's different. Now, you know why I do that? Because normally our students don't look at the text. I mean, if you say to them, Sorry, I'm a cynical teacher here. You say to the students, open your book at page 65. This takes about five minutes, we know, because they have to find the book, they have to talk to their friend. What page did he say? What, what, what have we done there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, get there. They open the book at page 65. What's the first thing they do? They look over the page to see how long it is. <laughs> And if it's long, they're dispirited. They are making an instant judgment about length only. And that judgment is normally negative. I want them to look at the text because a text is usually as long as it needs to be. <coughs> it's doing something that requires that length. And if, for example, it's all one long paragraph, all of us sort of think, oh, we all make that kind of judgment. When we're in a bookshop, we look at a book, we open it, and the, the font is dense, and the pages are with a room. We all like the pleasure of reading, and the pleasure of reading is also the visual. Mm -hmm. It's also the holding a nice book in our hand, not a book that is too heavy, not that a book that is embarrassing to be seen reading on the metro. Mm -hmm. You notice that, I don't know if they did it here, but in, in England they made an adult version of Harry Potter and a children's version with a different cover so that adults wouldn't be embarrassed to be seen reading a kid's book. <laughs> what? I mean, how, how clever marketing, but I would rather read the kid's version. You know? And it's only the cover that's different. Yeah. Marketing, marketing. Everything is marketing. So the look of the text is important. Tell me when you read it if it is similar or different <coughs> to the wall. Mm -hmm. Ready? You ask me if I have ever been to prison. Been to prison? Your world of murderers and thieves, of hatred and jealousy, and you ask me if I have ever been to I answer, yes, I'm still there, trying to escape. Similar? Now, I do, you didn't see the answers. I have to translate the answers because the answers are coming in visually. <laughs> the answers that I got from these girls here was, <laughs> now, is that a valid answer in class? Of course it is. Of course it is. But what we have to enable the students to do is to put that into words. Because very, very often, we give students something to react to. And because we're teachers of English, the poor students have to get it into English. Well, that's not easy when they're making this jump between referential and representation. So we have to think, what kind of language do you need <coughs> to translate into an answer? And the clue to this is modality. Modality. Because I'm sure that most of you 
and most of our students, my own students included, do not use modality very much. Modality is, it might be, it could be, maybe. Modality is anything that is not saying it is. Because our students in a referential teaching environment are always tempted to give a definite answer. It is, or it is not. Yes or no. But in fact, we've seen already that yes and no are not the only answers. The answer is, ah, that's interesting. It could be read that way. It might be seen as this. I think, i.e., what we need is the language of negotiation, the language of opinion, the language of possibility, probability. Because if they say it is not the same, I could say, oh, but I can see the same word in both texts. And they say, no, but it's not the same. Okay, it might not be the same. It could be read as not the same. In my opinion, it depends. I think that's the language they need, the language of discussion and opinion. So did you think, yes, it's the same <coughs> as the other one? I thought there was a similarity. I thought there was a similarity. Perfect answer. I thought there was a similarity. And you see what she's done very cleverly. She's not said yes or no. I thought there was a similarity. What did you think? It might be. <laughs> it might be. You see? Now, it might be is a very much better answer than yes or no. And it's using modal verbs, which help to soften the impact. You could say, yes, this is similar to the other one because of one word. Which word? Escape. Escape, Escape is the only link between the two. But then when you put two texts together, they start speaking to each other. These are two texts that I found from completely different contexts, but they speak to each other because of the shared word escape. Now, I'm going to introduce you another term. This is why PowerPoint is useless. I couldn't introduce this to you now if I had a PowerPoint because I'd be stuck with it. But I'm going to introduce this term. And I think this is life-changing. I think this is important. Binaries are things which come in what number? Two. Twos. Binaries are, we've already tried some, light and heavy, male and female, good and bad, yes and no. And you wanted to make a dialogue from the wall. Well, a dialogue is the first binary because any dynamic of a text is a binary of a conversation or a conflict or a contrast. And our students need to be able to read the dynamic, the clash, the conflict that makes the text spark. And this is why I introduce the term binaries. And I ask my students, in almost every text we read, what binaries can you see? And again, it's like representational language. Once you have done it for the first time, you will see binaries everywhere. <laughs> I've been told just recently Spider-Man 3 has more binaries than any movie ever. <laughs> they, they go to movies and they see binaries. And that means they think I'm right, which is good, because a little bit of respect for the teacher. Sometimes the teacher is right. Huh? Yeah. So now <coughs> you're going to do it. You're going to see what binaries can you find in this text. You are right. right. Let's be simple. There is no need to be complicated. The first binary is you and I. Yes. And that's your dialogue. Because as soon as we have a you, we want there to be an I. We want there to be some kind of exchange. Yeah? Ask and answer. 
And excuse me, that's in every language teaching book, lesson one. Ask and answer, you and I. More? Yes and no. Yes, no. What about this? Well, escape from prison. Prison? Prison and escape makes it. I'm going to pick up on the present perfect in just a moment because I have a passion for the present perfect. So you have at least, because the more you look, the more you will see, at least three significant simple binaries. What about the tennis match? Forty love, middle aged couple, uh huh, playing to. Uh, 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 well, it's all binaries, isn't it? Yeah, you'll see them everywhere. Now, I want to ask you what might seem to be a rather silly one. Because there are these nouns here. I want you to imagine a class that does not know these four vocabulary items. You wonder what world they're living in if they don't know words like murderers and thieves. But, but okay, imagine they don't know that vocabulary. Positive words or negative words? What can you tell me about them? Are they all the same? Are they different? They're all different. How are they different? You see, I want my students to start thinking how it means, not what it means, how. So we've seen that these are four <coughs> nouns. We've decided they're negative. But they're not all the same kind of nouns, are they? What's the difference? You see, you're thinking. <laughs> Fifth skill. Two of them are feelings and two of them. Good. Good. That's what I want. Because these are plural. <laughs> Bang, crash, chaos. These are plural and they are people. And these are feelings, emotions. More, more abstract, if you like. Abstract and personal. Now, if we can get the students working in that direction, it means they are less fixated on the dictionary meaning. Of course, these are words that they should know in terms of the dictionary meaning. But they are different because they're people and plural, emotions or feelings, and singular. Could we substitute these words with anything else? Would it be different if we said, your world of Bush and Blair? <laughs> <laughs> And I think it would not be very different. <laughs> now, that's why my question, I asked you already, would it be different if, when we were looking at the wall? That's one of my favorite questions, to help the students to see how it means. Would it be different if? And we are rewriting the text as an experiment. But what we are allowing the student to do is to touch the text, hands on the text practically looking at the text, processing it, seeing what would happen if. And that is a different relationship between reader and text from the normal student-text relationship. Because they think the text is authoritative or mysterious. Well, we're trying to demystify it, to give them a personal relationship with the text. And if they have a personal relationship with the text, they're going to be less frightened of it, less intimidated by it. This is such a good text. It looks a simple text, but there's a lot going on here. And I'm, at, oh, I'm walking right up to the camera, really confusing the thing now. Hello. <coughs> I didn't know we'd sold the movie rights to this game. But that's maybe why Tom Cruise was for it. <laughs> now, you pointed out our old friend, the present perfect. Do your students have problems with the present perfect? I think every student in the world, they, they say to me, but John, why don't they just drop the present perfect? 
I mean, you want to drop reading comprehension. We love you for that. Can't you drop the present perfect? Yeah, sorry. In fact, I keep using texts that show them the present perfect because I believe the present perfect is an indicative problem for our students. Because our students, if you do the present perfect on Friday with your students, you can bet that on Monday they've forgotten it. They've lost it. If you ask the students, when do you use the present perfect, i.e. the theory, they can press the button. The present perfect is used for an action which begins in the past and continues to the present. I am studying English from five years. For some reason, the present perfect is something that they find very difficult to produce. Therefore, I want to expose them to it more and more and ask, would it be different if you ask me if I ever went to prison? You ask me if I have ever been to prison? It's different. We don't want them to explain the difference. We want them to feel the difference. Because only by feeling and intuition can they start to appreciate the language. Now this is something that you guys went through a long period before you felt sensitized to the language. When I, I lived in Italy for many years and I remember the process very well of suddenly feeling comfortable and it's a process of climbing, 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 and then suddenly there's a different air that you breathe. Well, I want to help them get there sooner, easier, by exposing them to wider range of texts. And one of the reasons that the present perfect is good here, I'm going to show you, and this is Uncle John's trick number 413. <laughs> We've seen the binaries, you, me, ask, answer, prison, escape. <coughs> One amazing thing that I have discovered about most representational texts, 95% <coughs> perhaps, is that if we follow the tenses of the verbs, we can find the movement of the whole text. Look. Present. Present perfect. Ellipsis, eliminating the verb. Then this dense part with nouns, no verbs. Then repeat. Ask me, have I have ever been to prison? Present, present perfect. Mm -hmm. Present simple, present simple. Present continuous. Moving towards the future. Now that is astonishing to me because the movement of the text is from present towards the past, back to the present, towards the future. Every text moves like that in some way, between past and present, between present and future, between you and me, between ask and answer, between prison and escape. Look at the end there. Our students never <coughs> even see punctuation. They don't, it just doesn't register on their radar. <laughs> this is a good example to show you. Remember the question, would it be different if there was only one dot? And now you're getting more confident. You see, you, you, you feel easier to reply to that question. Would it be different if? How would it be different if it was one dot? One dot in English we call? Full stop. Full stop. But this indicates? Continuing. So the dots are helping the sense how it means. This of course means that from now on, every time they see three dots, they say, ah, John, three dots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. But it's not the same every time, is it? Because look, 
The same or different? Mm -hmm. And very often, as a teacher, you just leave the question. Because it's not the same, but it's not different. Um, and that kind of... Mm, and sometimes you want them to answer, and sometimes you want to leave them thinking. Because this one above could be your world of murders and thieves and hatred and jealousy and continuing a list. Or it could be exasperation, hatred and jealousy and... Couldn't it? Question of interpretation. And that's what we've been doing. We've been showing how possibilities of interpretation can happen. But listen to what we've just learned. You are my class. We've just been through this text. And I could ask you now to write something about this text. How happy am I going to be if you will say to me, this text, notice we've been using the word text all the time. I haven't been saying poem or song or story, text. Mm -hmm. This text involves two participants, you and I, one asking and one answering about being in prison or escaping. Full stop. It moves between the past and the present and towards the future. Full stop. Am I happy? Wow. <laughs> wow. Am I happy? Because you know what they haven't done? They haven't given me a summary of the text. They haven't done multiple choice A, B, C, D. Because I can't imagine some questions A, B, C, D on this. <laughs> They haven't mentioned the murderers, thieves, hatred, and jealousy. But what, do you want them to mention everything? If they can give me these two sentences that I just gave you as an answer about this text, <clears throat> this is why it's important that they know what we expect from them. I am not asking them to relate this to the novels of Kafka. We are not doing some huge literary philosophical anguish making thing. We are looking at how it means. If my student, because some students want immediately to tell you how they identify with it and how they feel trapped in prison, yeah, 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 fine. No problem. That is, however, personal interpretation building upon the reading that they have done. Personal interpretation is fine as long as it has a solid basis. But we all know how frequently students throw themselves at an interpretation and tell you how passionately they feel. But it's got no solid ground under it. The solid ground is the text and how it works. Showing them how it works gives them the possibility to look at other texts and how they work. They already can go for binaries. They can already go for the movement of the text. They can already look, and this is the difficult one, they can look at difficult vocabulary and be a little bit less intimidated than they have been in the past. I'm Scottish, and I, we have the reputation created by the English <laughs> that we are mean. <laughs> the reason we are mean is because we have no money because they stole everything <laughs> from us. <laughs> we are very generous in our spirit, but not to them. And I tell my students when I'm working with a text, because we know, as teachers, we know when they don't know a lot of vocabulary. But I think you will all be familiar with the idea that they will say to you when you read a text of 150 words, they'll say, we don't know 20 words. They'll never tell you that they do know 120 words. Never. They're always looking at the negative 
of the vocabulary they don't know. I want to try to reverse that a little bit by getting them to look at the words they do know and make something from them before they look at the words they don't know. So I'm mean with meaning. And I tell them in a text of, say, 150 words, you know, the usual 20, 30 line text, I'm going to give you five words, but only after you've read it. And you're going to tell me what five words. And you divide them into groups. And each group has to select the five words. What they don't realize is they're busy reading the text. <laughs> it's deceitful of me. But I've got them reading the texts. And, uh, right, so they don't know murderers. Well, with this text, there would only be one. Because there are so few words, you'd only give them one. Right? But you, you see to them five. And the great thing is this group will have five, and this group will have five, and this group will have five, and this group will have five. So you have to collect in the lists, because you're not stupid either. And you put them all on the board. And of course, there's going to be 20. <laughs> you know what I did? I say, right, eliminate. And they look at you, no, you're horrible. You say, yep. You know that. You wanted five? You wanted five? Reduce it to five. What are they doing? They're thinking about vocabulary. And you get them looking at things and saying, no, we don't need that. It's an adjective. Positive. Therefore, leave it. And they're looking at the vocabulary the way we just did. Positive, negative, heavy word, light word, important word, unimportant word. And once they start to see that there are many unimportant words that they don't need. They maybe want them, but there's a binary for you, needing and wanting. The vocabulary that you want, well, they would prefer if we were simply walking dictionaries <laughs> and we give them every word that they don't know. I refuse. I am not paid enough well, I'm not paid enough anyway, full stop. <laughs> I think this is a universal phenomenon. But I'm not paid enough to be a teacher and a walking dictionary. They've got to start becoming autonomous about vocabulary if they are going to make any progress as readers of literature. Because you and I know from experience that we've learned to read without worrying too much about the vocabulary. That took us a long time. I want to help my students to get there quicker than I did. By making them do the work themselves. Making them do the thinking about it. Because thinking is the first big step towards autonomy. Autonomy in reading, autonomy in being able to think for themselves. I'm not asking my students just to read English. I'm asking them to read the world around them. And that means that we have to enable them. And that is a difficult role for teachers. I apologize because this is badly written, but it's because it's normally on a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Teachers have to, and this is by Claire Cramsh, whom I recommend to your attention, American, but very good. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers have to impart a body of knowledge, but learners have to discover that knowledge for themselves in order to internalize it. How can teachers at the same time give it to them and make them discover it on their own? This question is the fundamental paradox of education. In referential language teaching, we are inputting all the time. With representational texts, we can put it over to the students and help them learn for themselves. We become enablers, giving them the enabling texts and the enabling language to make that progress as readers of literature. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I am threatened.
end with you asking questions. Okay. Asking questions or making criticisms of what? Good, no questions, bye. <laughs> Oh, here she goes, here she goes. You can expect it from Laurie, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, why do you think that uh, teachers or some teachers are afraid of uh, accepting some, uh, as you said, different answers when they can be possible and right answers? Because I, I suppose that all of us have the experience. Um, I remember when I was a university student, there was an American professor, he was American but he was great <laughs> as well, and he accepted um, an answer from me, which um, it was completely different from what uh, he had presented in the class. It was about um, an American novel. And uh, I had the experience of another teacher, and the same happened to, to some friends of mine who were studying with me, who did just the, the opposite. If he had uh, argumented an, an interpretation, he, he didn't accept anything different from that, so what, what do you think that we can do um, to face that problem with secondary students? Or what can I'm teachers sure, do? I'm sure that that's something familiar to all of us. I'm sure that any of you who have some intelligence <laughs> have had that problem with teachers, that you've given an answer and you've been told, no, you're wrong because the teacher is always right. The old-fashioned role of the teacher was that the teacher was right, the teacher was an authority figure. But we all know the best teachers are the teachers who don't impose, who bring something out. Now, the reason that teachers are scared of this is because, and I presume you've all been in this situation, it's awful when you have to say, I don't know, for the first time. The first time that happens, you think, oh my God, I'm in the wrong job. I could be working in a bank. <laughs> and then we think, no, 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 no. The whole joy of teaching is learning from your students. And the day we stop learning from our students is the day we should stop being teachers ourselves. Because I get so much from my students that, that I'm learning all the time. The teacher who is afraid will be the teacher who does not admit other answers. Sometimes the answer is so crazy that you have to, div you have to invent a new strategy immediately. The, you remember the, um, this is something about Wi uh, William Blake, um, the rose. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. No. <laughs> and I, I said, what do you think the rose might symbolize? Now, rose is, is it gets a pretty obvious symbol of something. And one Arab student, she said, it symbolizes Lord God Almighty. And I thought, Lord God Almighty. <laughs> How do I say no without offending her, without... <laughs> and so I said to them, any other ideas? <laughs> and it was great because it meant that the kids reacted because they could see that they didn't agree. No, it symbolizes beauty. <sighs> Good. Uh, uh, yeah, it symbolizes a flower. Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, and then you get the class to decide, majority vote, what they think might be the best interpretation of this symbol. And you, as a teacher, have ducked out of the horrible moment. But that's something that, as teachers, we have to do practically every day in class, isn't it? Because you don't know what kind of crazy answers are going to come. You don't know what kind of crazy questions are going to come. I'm just glad that we live in the age of the internet where if you don't know an answer, you can send them off to do some research. <laughs> because it used to be, oh my, I'll go and try and find that answer for you by tomorrow. And how often could we do that before the internet? 
So some teachers are afraid because as language teachers, we know the right and wrong answer. As teachers of literature, with a small L or a capital L, we see what I like to call the plurality of meaning potential. The word love can mean love, or it can mean zero. Already, that's two, and that's more than one. And as soon as it starts to multiply, it can be more problematic. The teacher has to be more open. I enjoy being more open. I find it really boring, teaching only the present perfect, only the right and wrong answer. I want to open it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bon